players in the sport at that elite level. And, uh, he won't quite win that race. Nunes tries for the steal. Oh, what a move by Miguel. Um, well, hello everyone. Um, my name is Richard Allcroft. I'm the uh, president of World Wheelchair Rugby. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, this was um, specially made for us by a, a company that, that has been working with us recently uh, on, our, on our new brand change. And I hope you, uh, you enjoy the exciting new look and the name. Uh, we think this reflects our sport in a, in a lot better way in terms of, of what we do. Uh, and for those of you that don't know uh, who Will Wheelchair Rugby is, uh, we're the governing body for the sport of wheelchair rugby. And we now have several disciplines that we're, we're, we're looking to promote. Obviously, the Paralympic discipline is the core um, sport for our organisation. But, but we're also looking to bring in new disciplines that will hopefully attract different people more um, more disabilities into the sport. So we're looking to develop sports such as Rugby Fives. This is a brand new sport that's been um, developed in, in Great Britain. Uh, and we've already got um, Korea and Poland playing that sport. So it, we're right on the cusp of starting something new, which is very exciting. Uh, also, the low point game, uh, which has been around for a long time, uh, is something that we really want to focus on as well. Uh, and you may be well aware of wheelchair rugby within the Invictus Games, which also has a, a large profile. So we act as the governing body for all of those disciplines. Um, the new brand, well, it was, was sort of 10 years uh, as a, an in independent federation. So I think it was time to uh, refresh our look. Um, and as I said, the, the, the name of the organisation, I think, better reflects what we do. Um, why, why did we want to establish this medical conference? Well, um, athlete welfare is, is, is hugely important to us as an organisation. Uh, and I think it was time for us to also take a, a, another good look at that. I think in some ways we, 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 we realised that we should be doing that better. We needed to be better in terms of athlete welfare and ensuring that our processes are fit for purpose when we, when we talk about that. Um, and, and including people with a medical background is really important as part of that. And also classification. Uh, classification is such an integral part of the Paralympic movement. Um, and I think it's, it's important that that, um, that can affect your reputation as a sport. And it's really important that we have evidence-based research to back up everything that we do in regards to uh, classification. And you're seeing sports now really bringing a focus um, to that within the movement. Uh, and I think wheelchair rugby has been a leader in that, uh, which I'm very proud of. Um, thanks to Loughborough University and the Peter Harrison Centre for uh, their long-standing support, both um, in rugby in, in Great Britain and for ourselves. They're also a huge contributor to the Paralympic movement, working in 
many different sports. Um, and so, yes, a massive thank you to them for bringing this conference together. So it's a um, huge pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of the presentations that will take place. And so if I could perhaps hand over to, to Vicky, who I think is going to introduce the conference and, and, um, and kick things off. Vicky, thank you very much. Thanks, Richard, and thanks very much, everyone, for uh, for attending. I'm just uh, moving some notes so I don't forget some of the key bits that I'm meant to uh, to be saying and, and stay a little bit on on script today. So um, there might be people coming and going um, from today because it's quite a long stretch uh, here, I guess, uh, in the UK, running through to around about five or six o'clock this evening. But please do feel free to pop in and pop out of the sessions. Um, obviously, we're going to try and keep as much to the timetable as we can do. We may overrun as a worst scenario, but certainly we perhaps won't get ahead of time because we'll wait to start the presentations on time to allow you to perhaps come back into some sessions through your working days that you might be able to, uh, to attend if you aren't here to join us for the full duration. So like um, Richard alluded to, is uh, I, I'm from, from Loughborough University, so I'm Vicky Tolfrey, and I'm a professor in applied disability sport here. And I'd like to have warm welcomes here from the UK. Um, we here at Loughborough have had an interest in uh, wheelchair rugby since uh, around about 2006, 2007, with many wheelchair rugby players, the athletes, practitioners, supporting the PhD students here at Loughborough University. That's happened at a, a local level with regional clubs in the UK, nationally with uh, Great Britain, but most importantly, with some supported projects at an international level as well that have been done in collaboration with World Wheelchair Rugby and formerly, obviously, as they were known, the IWRF. Um, so we've worked with, with Richard and his predecessor um, before that, and obviously we do welcome um, the, the sort of kind invitation and collaborations that you've offered us and the support to actually successfully complete um, some of those projects. That brings me to uh, Dr Viola Altman um, because she was one of these key people that really embarked on this international aspect of some of our research here at Loughborough University where some key projects uh, within classification as one of those ones which Richard alluded to with uh, Dr Barry Mason as a postdoc here um, formerly at, at Loughborough University, where we, we worked on a key project that was international. And again, with Barry's expertise uh, and collaborative approach uh, in the sport of wheelchair rugby, we've also embarked on other projects since then um, around wheelchair player tracking um, and looking at the demands of the sport of wheelchair rugby. And again, that's where Richard's alluding to in terms of that athlete's well-being and the, and the welfare aspect of trying to disseminate and share that knowledge has been at the prime of our research here at Loughborough University, where we do want to disseminate that globally as well as nationally to obviously have successes from a Great Britain level, but more importantly, to look at the health and well-being of wheelchair rugby uh, players. That then sort of leads me uh, just to, I guess, just a couple of slides. Um, the first one being this one of some of the, the people and athletes, players that we've had in the laboratory um, here at Loughborough. But most importantly to this slide here, which is more around the scientific aspect of the sport of wheelchair rugby. Obviously, we can glean uh, evidence-based practice from other sports such as wheelchair basketball, wheelchair tennis, um, and other sort of para sports as such, and obviously we, we do do that. But from a wheelchair rugby perspective, it interested me to sort of think about, well, when was it first developed? And obviously back in 1976, for some people who, who may remember those, those days, then it was a group of Canadians that put together, I guess, the sport of, of wheelchair rugby. But interestingly, whilst sport was being played, um, in terms of wheelchair rugby. It wasn't until, until 1996 that uh, there was a demonstration event at the Atlantic, uh, Atlanta Paralympic Games. And I was actually fortunate that that was my first Paralympic Games that I attended, but that was actually with wheelchair rugby. But I did manage to get a glimpse of uh, seeing high-performance sports in the rugby arena uh, with the athletes who went to, to that event. 
within the same sort of context sort of in the uh, sort of late 90s, that's when specifically some research emerged on the sport of wheelchair rugby. And this figure here shows that sort of gradual increase where there's researchers globally, because the flags on the screen that I share with you are the key lead authors. So I might have missed, obviously, some of the nations at a global level who have actually done work within wheelchair rugby. And we also need to bear in mind that this is a very scientific search looking at a database which, for the non-academics in the audience, is um, PubMed. So it's where the academics publish their scientific research for it to be peer-reviewed and published. Obviously, it's important to publish work, but using the platform that we have done with Richard, Steve and his colleagues is that we work with WWR around the translation of this research. What does it mean to practice? What does it mean to, to the medics, the classifiers, the athlete players themselves, the strength conditioning coaches? That's the important piece that we want to be capturing out of the scientific research. So whilst obviously we've got people globally with this interest, and like I say, on this PubMed search, uh, we're finding just above 150 scientific research papers, and they're, they're increasing. And there's pockets of people still working in, in areas and got longevity within working within wheelchair rugby sports. What that sort of leads me to really is, is how we got to, the, to this point today. I've been working with, uh, with Steve, um, a chairperson, as well as Richard, the president from WWR, uh, and indeed Viola and, and some classifiers and, and Ken, who's going to be joining us a little bit later as a chairperson for today. He may well be on, on the call already uh, as the key medic. Um, but the key aspect that I want to be saying is that we put together the speakers for today around connections that we have here within the sport of wheelchair rugby. I thought it was important that we capitalised on a Paralympic year, so obviously we used the time to our advantage, but it all was a discussion quite, quite late, really, where I went to Richard and Steve and just said, let's do it. Let's, let's put on an educational event online and let's bring together an audience to learn about what has already been done within the sport of wheelchair rugby. So some of the people, if, if I say from a nice point of view, are people that have been there, done it, and they've got quite a big history of working within para sports. And some of the names on this list uh, that we brought together today are people who are finding their feet within the domain of the sport of wheelchair rugby. And hopefully the future's there for them to be learning and doing more research in that particular area. So like I mentioned, it's quite a select list. And the purpose of that was because I wanted to make this event run this year and be successful. What I've been discussing with, uh, with Ken, with Richard, with Steve and Viola and Sven as sort of like the, the organising committee, and I thank them for today's event, is how can we further the knowledge and invite the audience to participate in this event in future years? So that's something that we can have an ongoing discussion and wrap up at the end of today's session. So speakers, I won't, I won't sort of mention them by, by name here, but obviously I do thank you for... Um, coming and, and presenting your, uh, your work and your interest within the wheelchair rugby domain today. And obviously we will briefly just introduce you before you embark on your presentations uh, later on um, today. And like I say, it is targeted, but it, it's no way means that's where we're going to be going forward. We'd like to perhaps run a specific event on a topic by the membership and feedback from today's session as well. So we welcome your feedback of how this how this has, uh, has run as well. So on that note, so I'm conscious of time is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass over to, uh, to uh, Sven, just to take care of um, the first um, upload, but obviously it's me that's going to be doing the introduction. So let me just um, stop sharing my screen and get past the technology piece and uh, just pass over to Sven and Viola, and then I can do some introductions. Koski, Pidcock and Laporte amongst them. Right, so just great. So we've got the transition now to the first part of, uh, of today. We've got sort of three sections um, for, for today. The first one being more around classification and science. 
Uh, then we'll move um, where we're going to be talking more about the wheelchair rugby performance. Um, and then we'll then move to the physiology and health and more the medicine piece. We'll wrap up piece at the end with Viola, um, where we've actually got a player and representation at an IPC and wheelchair rugby level um, as well. So on this note, I just would like to, uh, to welcome Viola. Viola is one of these early researchers where her PhD was within the realms of classification in para sports. I don't envy uh, that particular area and her expertise because she certainly moved the, uh, the sport forward quite tremendously by embarking on her PhD. And I guess that's a sideline to what she does because she actually is a medical doctor um, as well. She's got an affiliation to Loughborough University. She's um, a visiting, um, holds a visiting position here. So I welcome her as part of our research team. But she's going to be sharing her insights um, around classification in wheelchair rugby. So over to you, Viola. And sorry, we, we've done a video because she's got a bit of noise in her in her house, but she will be able to answer some questions. My name is Viola Altman and I'm one of the wheelchair rugby classifiers and I work for everyday life in the rehab centre Klimendal in Arnhem, the Netherlands. I would like to invite you in the movement lab of Klimendal in Arnhem, which is the hotspot for classification research. A lot of classification research nowadays for wheelchair rugby takes place in this movement lab. I am happy to contribute to the first ever conference on science and sports medicine of world wheelchair rugby. In this presentation, I'm going to tell you everything about the development of classification in your sport. Unfortunately, I cannot make it live at this session, but I will be live at the final session at the roundup. So keep your questions in mind and I will try and answer them. To start off my presentation, I feel the urge to go back to the grassroots of classification. Classification is not so rare, and as a matter of fact, we do it in everyday life. After I've specified what we do in everyday life for classification, I'll continue with classification in Paralympic sports with a focus on wheelchair rugby. After that, I'll introduce you to the principles of evidence-based classification, and not only because this is the way IPC wants us to develop, but also because I truly believe that developing evidence-based classification is the way to make classification just as professional as your own sport. After that, it all may seem a little bit theoretical and a bit uh, boring, but as a matter of fact, it is not. If we all cooperate in developing evidence-based classification and use the outcomes to improve your sport, it can make your sport so much better and can make classification so much better. Therefore, I'll uh, show you the results of the uh, research that has been done so far, and I will also show you how you can use the outcomes to improve your sport to make it more attractive and to perform even better. After that, I'll give you a sneak preview of the research that we're currently doing, uh, without the outcomes, of course, but then you know what's going on and in which way we will develop in future. To show you why we do classification, I have an example. In the slide, you can see a 10-year-old girl running a 100-meter sprint against Usain Bolt. Now, you all know who's going to win this race. It's undoubtedly uh, Usain Bolt. However, that does not determine who of the two is the best athlete, because the girl is a girl and not a boy, uh, and she is still very young, and maybe in future she will win more, uh, more golden medals than Usain Bolt ever did, so she might be the best athlete. Now you can see that performance is determined not only by who's the best athlete, but also by uh, age and uh, age-related maturity, by gender, by equipment, by training, by experience. And um, the only thing we want to know is who is the best athlete and he or she should win the gold medal in the end. Because the outcome of the race between Usain Bolt and the girl is not very exciting to watch and is also not very exciting for both athletes, uh, we classify these athletes. Performance is determined by many factors and we try to um, neutralize some of these factors to make competition exciting and fair. And you can see that performance can also be determined by equipment and ideally every athlete has the same access to equipment so that equipment will not determine who's going to win the competition. 
So now we know that we do classification to level out the impact of some factors on the outcome of the competition. And then you think some classifications may be easy, like the classification between men and women. But it never is, because there's always someone who does not really fit into the system. An important example is Casta Semenya. She's a very good runner and has always known herself to be female. But when she was tested, because some people thought she looked rather male-like, uh, she was uh, found to have XY chromosome and high levels of testosterone. She, was, she suffered from a rare medical condition uh, in which she cannot use that testosterone. So if you have testosterone and you cannot use it in any body cell, then can you compete as a male or as a female athlete? The answer to that question is up till today unknown. So you can see that even in things that are seemingly simple, uh, simple like male and female classification, there are difficulties um, putting some, uh, some athletes in the right place. Another difficult issue in classification is fairness versus competition. And I can show you this with an example of children. We typically classify children based on age. So we put them in age groups based on their year of birth. But you can imagine that a child that was born on December 31st um, has much more commonality with a child born of on January the 1st of the next year of birth than with a child that was born in the same year of birth on January the 1st. Now we could make that more fair um, to make age categories in months or even days, but then there would be no competition and everyone wins a gold medal. Um, and that's also not fun to watch and not fun to do. So we have to make uh, classes that are large enough to have competition, but small enough to get fair competition. And that's always uh, a bit of an issue. There is even evidence to support that uh, children who are born between January and June have a significantly higher um, chance to become elite athletes than uh, children who are born between July and December. And even though we know it, we still maintain those classes of uh, one year uh, of birth um, to uh, guarantee a good competition. In Paralympic sports, we also have a goal in classification, and that is to minimize the impact of impairment on the outcome of competition. So this time we do not classify gender, we do not classify age, we classify impairment. I have an example, and that example is Riley Bett, an athlete we all know. On the top photo, you can see Riley Bett when he was 14 or 16 years of age. He was not well trained, he was rather chubby, um, and he had no experience at all. Yet he was classified as 3.5, which at that time seemed to be a rather high class because his performance did not resemble the average athlete in that 3.5 class. However, in uh, the years after he was introduced to the sport, he developed tremendously. He developed his muscles, he uh, had age-related maturation, which also helped in the development of his muscles. Um, he learned to know the game much better, he learned to know his capabilities much better, he got used to using a wheelchair in which he was not used previously, um, and his coach knew how to coach him. So his performance increased tremendously, and he's the best athlete the, the world has ever known in wheelchair rugby. However, his classification stays, stays the same because his impairment has not uh, changed. He has limb deficiencies and those limb deficiencies are still the same. So his classification stays the same, although his performance is totally different. So based on performance, you cannot determine uh, what the class of an ath athlete should be because so many other aspects determine performance. So classification should only be based on impairment and the impact of impairment on the performance, but not on performance in itself. Now there's another problem in classification in Paralympic sports, and especially in team sports, because to make a team you need enough athletes, and because every impairment type is different and every impairment severity is different, you have to group athletes and put athletes with different impairment types into the same group. An example shown on this slide is Riley Bett, uh, Riley Bett versus Lars Mertens. They are both in a 3.5 uh, class, but they have totally different impairment types. Riley Bett has limb deficiencies, and Lars Mertens had coordination impairment. Are these athletes in the same class, and is this right? 
nobody knows. And therefore, we need evidence-based classification to see if the impact of the coordination impairment of Lars is similar to the impact of the limb deficiency on the game of Riley Bat. This answer is currently unknown, and we need evidence-based classification to get those answers. To develop evidence-based classification, IPC has provided us with a framework, which you can see on the slide. Now, team sports like wheelchair rugby have several problems that make the development of evidence-based classification more difficult than for individual sports. First of all, to make a team, we have to put athletes with several, several impairment types, but also impairment severities, into one team. We do this by adding up classification scores to a maximum score that can be put on the court. But nobody knows if this is fair. Is a lineup with 4 times 2.0 players, or with two 3.5s and 2.5s, which both add up to 8 point total score, uh, are these teams the same? Nobody knows. And this is also a topic that can be addressed by evidence-based classification, but it's not an easy topic. The second difficulty is that performance is not easy to measure. You can imagine that in a 100 meter sprint, the outcome time, you can measure it and it's objective. However, if you score in a team sport, that is determined by the athlete himself, by his teammates, but also by uh, the, the other team, how well they defend their goal. So measuring performance is difficult and we still have to find ways to measure uh, the impact of uh, impairment on performance in team sports. I always think that developing evidence-based classification is like eating an elephant. Eating an elephant is a difficult task, but it can be done. And you do it one bite at a time. So this is what I invite you to do. Um, eat a part of the elephant one bite at a time together with the researchers. So in the end, we can develop evidence-based classification. For most of you, behind the scenes, we have uh, worked together with several research groups to develop evidence-based classification for your sport. It is by no means perfect at this moment, but we have developed a lot of knowledge and we put that into our system, so it has improved over time. In the next slide, I will guide you through the outcomes of research so far, and I will show you how you can use those research outcomes to improve your sport and make it more exciting and to perform better. Because developing evidence-based classification is a huge task, and we wanted to do it one step at a time, we also wanted to address the steps that are most important for you as athletes. Therefore, I'd like to recall the classification survey that was done in 2010 to define those topics that you felt the classification system was most lacking in, and we put them first in our research agenda and addressed them first. So we have improved according to your needs. First, we addressed the trunk classification system. Previously, there were only three possible trunk scores, and we have increased that into three possible trunk scores. It's called the trunk impairment classification system, or uh, abbreviated by TIC. We have developed new tests, and we have tested those uh, in a research lab, in which we could determine if four categories were indeed the right number of categories, um, and if there were significant differences between those categories. And indeed, we did find those. The differences we found were that athletes with tick score zero um, had significantly um, less trunk muscle strength than athletes in the other tick categories. And also, they could not sit unsupported. On the other hand, we found athletes with tick score 1.5 to have significantly a higher range of movement when they were sitting and moving their trunk around um, than the athletes in the other categories. By doing this research, we know now that the measures you do for trunk impairment are valid against uh, research standards. Much more important for your sport is the impact of that trunk impairment on your ability to perform. Um, we found out that the higher your trunk score is, the better you are in accelerating. So the velocity is higher in the first two to three meters, but after that, arm impairment seemed to be more important than trunk impairment. Making a 180 degrees turn was not dependent on trunk impairment, but was only dependent on maximum velocity. 
Furthermore, we found out that athletes with trunk scores 0.5 to 1.5 can push themselves beyond the reach of low point athletes or athletes with zero points for their trunk. So they would be out of reach to make a successful hit and then they can push themselves without having a barrier. In addition, athletes with tick score 1 and 1.5 can produce a higher impact in a hit than athletes with uh, trunk scores 0 and 0 0.5 and they can tilt that chair to a relevant height so they can hop out of a block. Now how can you use that information to improve your own game um, and use it very practically in your training at this moment? If you know that athletes with tick scores 1 and 1.5 can accelerate and mainly accelerate in their first push, that means that if you can uh, trap them, they are pretty ineffective. You cannot really uh, shadow them, because if an athlete is shadowed by an athlete with tick score 0, he will almost certainly lose. The other thing you can use, knowing that they can hop out of blocks, um, you can use that to make your strategy on how to make that block on an athlete like that. On the other hand, if you have an offensive athlete with tick scores 1 or 1.5, you know that they should, for example, not do the inbound because then they can be trapped and they are ineffective. So they need their space to accelerate in those first meters. Our next project for research was to test the impact of arm strength impairment on performance in wheelchair rugby. First, we developed strength tests, which you can see on the slides. So we developed tests for elbow flexion and extension, um, shoulder flexion and extension, and a pull and a push isometrically in a wheelchair. We know through research that athletes who compete in wheelchair rugby and who have impairment in strength in uh, their arms, in the lower classes of wheelchair rugby, um, they have significant uh, less strength than able-bodied persons. On the other hand, we also tested female athletes and compared those, and those were able-bodied female volunteers, and they had 40 to 50 percent less strength than able-bodied uh, male volunteers, which is an important finding. And of course, before we started uh, the measurements, we also determined if uh, those measures were reliable. So if you test an athlete, the same athlete, two or three times, if the outcome is the same, and the outcome is indeed reliable. When we tested the differences between athletes of several classes, the 0.5, the 1, the 1.5, and the 2-point arm scores, um, we found significant differences in the classes between uh, several of the, imp uh, the strength impairment tests. So elbow flexion, elbow extension, shoulder flexion and shoulder extension, and also in the isometrical push, which makes those tests valid uh, when related to lab-oriented tests. The next step after determining if the tests were valid and reliable, of course we want to know the impact of the impairment on your ability to perform. We indeed found that athletes with more strength impairment in their arms um, had more um, difficulties in performing a 10 meter sprint, so they were slower. And that uh, impact was larger in a 10 meter sprint than in a 2 to 3 meter sprint, which fits with the previous outcomes uh, of trunk impairment. Trunk impairment is more important in the, four, in the first two to three meters, and arm impairment is more important from two to 10 meters. Now, examples of how you can use this information in your own training sessions and in recruiting new athletes is that based on the strength uh, difference between male and female able-bodied athletes, you can imagine that athletes, high point female athletes, may be less effective than high point male athletes, whereas the difference between low point male and female athletes is less. Yet you get the same deduction uh, of your maximum point score from 8.0 on the court for uh, high point and low point female athletes. So if you want to recruit female athletes in your team, 
uh, I think we have reasons to believe that a low point female athlete is more effective than a high point female athlete. The other thing is that we know now that training elbow extension strength and training shoulder flexion strength may improve your performance in a 10 meter sprint. After the outcomes of the research that was already finished, I'm going to introduce you to research that is currently being done uh, partially in my research center. So far, classification research and the impact specifically of impairment on performance was limited to chair activities. So we measured the impact on a sprint, on the ability to turn and on the ability to hop your chair. But we were not able to measure the, Im the impact uh, of impairment on ball activities because ball activities are more difficult to standardize. So we first started with a literature research uh, in which we included all kinds of sports um, that were uh, using a ball with their hands, so not with a bat or a stick, and to see if in any of the able-bodied or the other Paralympic sports than wheelchair rugby had any good tests that are reliable and valid to measure performance of ball activities. Based on this literature research, we are currently developing a standardized test set that we can measure ball activities uh, and the impact of impairment on ball activities. Um, another section of the research is focusing on uh, classifying coordination impairment. Classifying coordination impairment in an objective and reliable way is at this moment not possible in wheelchair rugby. So we largely base um, the classification we put athletes in on performance, which is not the right way to go and which is not evidence-based. We are developing tests um, at single level, which are the repetitive movement tests, and those are uh, movements at the shoulder level, the elbow level, the forearm level, the wrist and the fingers, in which an athlete has to perform as many repetition, flexion, extension or pro and supination as possible in a certain time frame. The second test we are developing is the spiral test. The spiral test is an attractive test because it tests multiple levels of movement at the same time. You can imagine that with, if you have to draw the spiral that you see on the slide with a pen, you are moving your shoulder, your elbow, your forearm and your fingers all at the same time. Um, we are measuring uh, EMG to see which muscles are used, accelerometers to see how fast people move, and also we're measuring pen pressure to see if people with, um, persons with coordination impairment use more pen pressure to uh, make the spiral. And of course, we measure the time um, an athlete needs to perform the spiral. Of these tests, we will be testing the test-retest reliability. So if uh, athletes perform the same, if you repeat the test. And more importantly, we're also testing these tests if to see if we can detect intentional misrepresentation. Getting back to the schedule of evidence-based classification, if we can combine the outcomes of impairment testing and coordination impairment uh, with um, objective measures for ball activities, uh, we can determine uh, the number of classes that is needed, minimum impairment, and the borderlines of those classes for coordination impairment. And classification of coordination impairment will be more fair and more transparent. So now you can see we're well on the way um, with eating the elephant and developing evidence-based classification. But we do need your help. We need the help of all the coaches uh, and all the athletes because you are the persons to help us with research and to determine the outcomes. We also need uh, the help of World Wheelchair Rugby. Although uh, the research center where I work, Klimendal in Arnhem, the Netherlands, offers tremendous opportunities to perform research in classification in wheelchair rugby. And we have a good cooperation with the Peter Harrison Center for Disability Sport. We still need more support. So please feel free to add sponsorship to what we're already doing. Thank you all for listening. Uh, and I can imagine there will be many questions. Please feel free to ask your question after this presentation or to ask it at the end of the day in the roundup session. Thanks very much, uh, Viola.
Um, I'm just seeing if you've got your camera on. Uh, you've got a little bit of noise, mm -hmm. I know, in your house. But uh, let's run with the run with maybe um, the next five minutes, if it could be a bit quiet in your background, with any questions that might pop up. Um, so please maybe just unmute and quickly just shout out with who you are and whether you've got a question, Viola, and I'll just try and field as best as I can. Um, I have a question. This is Deborah Bowditch in Cardiff. Okay, fire away. Um, Viola, just one thing from what you were saying. I was just interested about what you were saying with regards to low point female athletes being more valuable than high point. And I guess this, I hadn't realized this, and I feel that that's a little bit concerning for those high point females out there. And I'm just wondering whether there's any thoughts as to how we address this, whether there's an adjustment to the 0.5 allowance on court or I don't know. I it just I guess that that concerned me. Yeah, uh, I can imagine uh, that it does concern you because it also concerns me. Um, there's no real evidence um, for this statement. There's just signs that this may be the case. And if you look at the international platform um, of all athletes who are competing, the most successful athletes, female athletes, are indeed all low pointers. Mm -hmm. um, so this may implicate um, that the subtraction of 0.5 for your lineup on the court is not enough for high point female athletes. Yeah, we need yeah. more science to back that up. Uh, but meanwhile, you know where you need to recruit um, which athletes you can recruit by using the system as it is now. Yeah. Um, we found some important um, information, I think, um, that the difference in strength, in arm strength, between um, men and women, and those were able-bodied um, men and women, is 40 to 50 percent, which is just as much as the difference in arm muscle strength between... Um, able-bodied volunteer males and male low point athletes so that's a huge difference between yeah. men and women and you can imagine if you are a low point athlete and you don't have many muscles that absolute difference is less than when you should have normal strength because you're a high point athlete um, and that absolute difference is larger so I think you can put some questions to the current competition rules, although we do not have evidence on what is the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah, interesting. It is. For that. So, yeah, research always leads to other questions, which is the interesting and more, research. and more research, yes. But we will try and do the first things first. Yeah, cool. Thank you for that. Okay, I just got a quick Great. question, Viola that's come into the chat box uh two questions we might have time to maybe for you to type your answer in one of them um but someone's just questioning around how did you test the difference between two meters and 10 meter sprint test is it uh, is the difference just because of the wheelchair itself um the way we tested it was in the same test so we just put um how do you call these these um, sensors at two and ten meters? So we asked yeah. to perform a full sprint, and we measured when they passed the gate for two meters and they passed the gate for ten meters. So it was all within the same sprint. There was no difference in uh, chairs or any equipment. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. So for people perhaps who haven't got timing gates, obviously it's quite a sensitive uh, device that enables you to do quite precise measurements. Another question's coming online, Viola. Uh, do you have any idea about the timeline by which your findings will be implemented into the classification system? <laughs> um, that's always a difficult one because I generate evidence uh, and knowledge. Uh, but it's in the end, it's the membership of the World Wheelchair Rugby who determines if uh, anything is implemented. So usually we've got implementations in the year after the Paralympic Games, so not at the year where everyone is preparing for a big event. Um, so I think if we have any new findings at this moment, the implementation will at least be three to four years before it's, it's past the membership. 
Okay, thanks for that. At that point, we'll thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Viola. It was excellent. Just to let people know that we are recording this session. So if people have got sensitive questions, then please leave them maybe till the end and we can keep speakers on if, if we want to edit the video. Um, but obviously we are sharing this with our audience overseas that can't join us because of the time zone. So again, we can provide maybe speaker emails for any private chat if you want to do that uh, offline as well. But thanks very much, Viola. Um, conscious of time and I want to keep to time. Um, so I'm now going to just um, switch over and invite Ingrid, who I'm now looking at Sven should have things ready. Um, and we can just switch over from Viola. So Viola, you stop sharing your screen, although actually I think it was Sven, wasn't it? We can then switch to, um, to Ingrid. So whilst Ingrid is just setting up her screen, um, I'd just like to just do a, a quick introduction um, to Ingrid. Um, obviously, I've been practicing for many evenings how to pronounce your surname, and I'm going to go for um, that. We've got uh, Dr. Ingrid Kalvisa. Maybe I've completely said that wrong, and I do apologise, but that's the best attempt I can do today. Um, who's been working in the field of rehabilitation sciences and has worked quite uh, tremendously over the last few years with um, a hand cycling battle back uh, related sort of project, but at the same time has got a great interest around people with a spinal cord injury and the application of rehabilitation exercise to sport. And I know that she's done quite a nice study that's looking at the effects of trunk muscle activation in wheelchair rugby players with a spinal cord injury. And that's what we've invited her to share with us today a more shorter, concise presentation that's about one specific research project. So over to you now, Ingrid. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Vicky. Um, I hope you can all see my screen. Um, this afternoon, I would like to tell you a little bit more about our study on effect of trunk muscle activation um, in wheelchair rugby players with a spinal cord injury. We conducted the study um, at uh, REA, the Rehabilitation Center in Amsterdam, together with the VU University in Amsterdam. Yes. Okay, when we consider athletes, uh, wheelchair rugby athletes with a cervical spinal cord injury, there are several consequences that might uh, impact wheelchair rugby performance. The first one is, of course, motor function. So the impaired motor function under the lesion level, um, which results in an impaired trunk stability, uh, but also an impaired arm strength. Of course, there's also the loss of sensory function under the lesion level. And um, the third one is the loss of sympathetic innervation under the lesion level. And that impacts organs. So for example, um, the maximum heart rate and so when you perform sports activities your heart rate will not rise um, to as high as you you would expect uh, and also the blood vessels are uh, affected so there is less vasoconstriction under the lesion level which results in venous pooling of the blood in the in the legs and the uh, abdomen and uh, therefore the blood pressure is also um, quite low and um, well, in rehabilitation, uh, we use um, electrical stimulation, and that is an external activation of the muscles. So we use electrodes on the muscles um, for patients with a spinal cord injury. On the left, for example, you can see uh, a patient with a very high cervical lesion, and he uses electrical stimulation of the arm muscles, uh, which allow him to perform um, arm crank exercise. On the right side, you can see um, a patient with, with a lower spinal cord injury and he uses the Verco bike, which is a device that you can use um, uh, for, well, hand cycling with your arms, but uh, his legs are uh, paralyzed and he uses electrical stimulation to, um, to also cycle with his legs. And we were very curious what the effects of electrical stimulation would be on the trunk. So what if we stimulate the trunk muscles um, at the abdomen, but also at the back at the same time, so we create co-contraction, what would the effect be on motor function, on, on the, the stiffness of the trunk? Um, what would the effect be on the stability 
of the trunk and also on blood pressure. So our hypothesis was that the electrical stimulation would lead to co-contraction of the trunk muscles. And on the one hand, it would lead to an increased trunk stability. And because the trunk stability would increase, it would also form a more stable base to perform uh, wheelchair pushing. So if we could measure arm force and power, we thought it would increase. On the other hand, if we um, stimulate the trunk muscles, our hypothesis was that it would increase the intra-abdominal pressure and therefore the venous pooling would decrease and the blood pressure would rise. And our final hypothesis was that this all together would result in a better wheelchair rugby performance. So all these components were tested during our study and we included uh, 11 Dutch uh, elite wheelchair rugby athletes, all with uh, a cervical spinal cord injury. And first we assessed the trunk stability. So we let them perform a reaching test and uh, they had to reach in several directions. So forward with both arms, uh, lateral and diagonal. And we measured the reaching distance. And of course we, we let them do the reaching with and without electrical stimulation of the trunk. And if we see the results, we see that in total, uh, when we compare electrical stimulation with um, or without electrical stimulation, we can see that the reaching distance is larger uh, with electrical stimulation. So they really had to make the movement uh, in, a con in a controlled manner. So they had to reach and go back to the original position without falling forward. And we can see that, that the distance is, is larger when we applied electrical stimulation. And you can also see that this difference is, is mainly due to the diagonal direction of the dominant arm. So the athletes were really um, better at performing uh, diagonal reaching with the dominant arm, 33% higher uh, reaching um, distance with electrical stimulation. So the stability of the trunk improved with electrical stimulation. Then we wanted to measure arm force and power. So we measured that with the Biodex uh, ergometer. Um, the athletes had to push away the handle. They had six attempts uh, per arm and we tested the dominant and the dominant, dom dominant arm. And we measured peak force and peak power. And of course, again, we, um, we, we tested them with and without electrical stimulation. And this is what we found. So on the left side, you can see the force and on the right side, you can see the power. Um, on the X axis, you can see uh, the condition without electrical stimulation. And on the Y axis, you can see um, the condition with electrical stimulation. And you can see immediately that we only had five participants for this measurement. So that is, that is a, a little bit of a limitation for this uh, subtest. Um, and you can see that um, the line in the middle is the line of identity and um, four of, of five particip participants uh, are above the line of identity. So they performed better with electrical stimulation, but the differences were very, very small. And because the group was also so small, these differences were non-significant. So we are not quite sure whether arm force and power are really improved with electrical stimulation. But we also tested the blood pressure. So this was the protocol. The athletes just had to sit relaxed in their daily wheelchair uh, without electrical stimulation and we measured their blood pressure. Then we turned on the electrical stimulation and after one minute we uh, measured their blood pressure again. Then after two minutes, we measured their blood pressure again, and then we stopped the electrical stimulation and directly we measured their blood pressure again and after one minute. And this is what we found. So you can see that in baseline at the left side of the figure, the blood pressure is quite low and that is also something that you would expect. And then after one minute, the blood pressure shows a steep rise um, during electrical stimulation. And also uh, at two minutes of electrical stimulation, the blood pressure was still significantly higher than at baseline. 
you can see that there is a slight decrease uh, already during electrical stimulation and that decrease is um, continued when we stop so when we stop the electrical stimulation the levels of blood pressure were not significantly different from baseline so um, you can see that there is a steep rise during the stimulation protocol and it directly um, stops when we stop the electrical stimulation so it also had an, an effect on blood pressure and then we wanted to measure wheelchair rugby performance so we used the wheelchair uh, rugby uh, skill uh, test developed by um, uh, the group of Laurie Malone I think that Sonja de Groot in the next uh, presentation will also tell you a little bit more about these tests uh, but it consists of several subtests so the first one was the passing skill test and they had to throw a ball to a target on the wall um, they performed a 20 meter sprint they performed an endurance sprint around the court they performed ups and backs test so that is uh, a test where you had to ride to a cone and then backwards to the line and then to the next cone and then backwards and etc um, and they performed a, a slalom and of course they performed all tests with and without electrical stimulation and here you can see the results so the blue bars uh, they represent the electrical stimulation conditions and the red bars represent the um, non-electrical stimulation conditions and um, well you would probably expect that with electrical stimulation the athletes uh, would be faster so the, they would perform the test in less seconds but what you see is that the bars are almost equal so there was no effect of um, electrical stimulation and our thoughts are that um, that is because we make the tests very sport specific so for the uh, wheelchair rugby skills we wanted to be it as sport specific as possible so they performed all the tests in their wheelchair rugby chair also with abdominal strapping and we think that the additional effect of electrical stimulation on top of uh, abdominal strapping might be just too low to to have any significant effect so in conclusion we found um, uh, we found several effects of electrical stimulation on the trunk we found that the trunk was more stable and we found a, a rise in blood pressure and um, well to conclude I think that um, uh, in line with the presentation of Viola I think I have to, to say that trunk function is of course a very important aspect of wheelchair rugby performance and um, we found during our study that electrical stimulation enhances trunk stability and uh, blood pressure in wheelchair rugby athletes and uh, although we did not study this directly I think this also highlights the importance of uh, a stable trunk uh, which you can also achieve with abdominal binding um, currently um, the rules for using electrical stimulation during wheelchair rugby game uh, are not directly defined but the IPC um, uh, has stated that electrical stimulation is part of equipment and because it is not available to everyone uh, it should be turned off during competition but we are very curious uh, how this um, could lead to well new promising effects for rehabilitation and daily life purposes in patients with a spinal cord injury thank you very much thanks very much Ingrid just uh, conscious of time we've had two questions that have come in during your presentation the first one is um, are these results published somewhere and if I answer that one myself then I think you've published this paper haven't you yeah yeah so I can um perhaps publish the link in the chat yep that'd be great so the next question is i'm wondering if you have an answer with the non-dominant size didn't show a higher reaching distance yes that is that is also a thing a thing that we we thought about why is it only the dominant side and why is it only the diagonal side um and I think that, that in, in, in other research, uh, they also found that the diag diagonal uh, reaching um, 
um, site is also uh, the best um, um, way to, to investigate dynamic stability. So, so to reach diagonal is, um, um, is more sensitive to, to differences in dynamic stability. And um, we think that is the dominant side because um, players are perhaps more used to use the dominant side and therefore they, they dare to reach further. I, I'm not sure if that is the reason, but um, yeah, I think that might be one of the, the solutions for this, uh, for this question. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Ingrid. There's a couple of other questions around uh, blood pressure and abdominal strapping. If you can just uh, maybe answer those in the chat to the, to the questions, that'd be much appreciated. And I'll just push on to our next speaker, but thanks very much. We we'll just ask you to stop sharing your screen and I think um, Sven's going to take over now. Yes, fantastic. Um, so we'll continue with a more sport performance uh, focused session. Uh, in which we have presentations by Sonja de Groot first, and then Rima Vechter, and then uh, Rien van der Slikken. So I'll start introducing Sonja briefly. I won't uh, steal too much of her time. Uh, so she is a senior researcher at Reade and uh, an associate professor at VU, both in Amsterdam. Uh, and she will talk about field testing in wheelchair rugby, as you see. Over to you, uh, Sonja. Thanks, Sven, for the introduction and also for pronouncing my name uh, perfectly uh, correct. Um, as Sven said, I'm going to present uh, studies about field testing for wheelchair rugby. And as you all know, wheelchair rugby is a fast moving sport that involves actions like passing, sprinting, quick maneuvering of the wheelchair, but it also involves periods of high intensity and low intensity activity, and both anaerobic, so more sprinting capacity, and aerobic proficiencies, so more the endurance capacity. So therefore, it's important to evaluate skill-related components of wheelchair rugby performance and also aerobic capacity. So field testing is one method of assessing a player's game-related skills and fitness. But although wheelchair testing during standardized lab conditions is possible, and we as researchers often prefer the standardized lab tests, on-court sport-specific testing um, still remains the coach's preferred method. But of course, it's very important that these field tests are reliable. So the test and retest reliability is important, but also valid. So that you measure what you really want to measure. So I'm going to present the results of two studies. And the purpose of the first study was to assess the correlations among components of wheelchair rugby scale, as well as the reliability. And this was a study that was uh, set up by Kevin Orr and Lauren Malone from the Lakeshore Foundation uh, in the USA. And the purpose of the second study was to confirm whether peak aerobic capacity of laboratory-based treadmill testing could be replicated during a multi-stage field test in which are rugby players. And this was a study that was initiated by Vicky Tolfrey and Tom Paulson from the Loughborough University in the UK. So let's go to the first, oh, sorry, first um, um, study. It's about the, the wheelchair rugby skills. And we included in that study 12 national level wheelchair rugby players, um, both from the USA and from uh, the Netherlands. And all these players performed five wheelchair rugby skill tests, and they were performed on two different locations with two weeks in between. So the first test was a 20 meter sprint test. So there was a sprint from a stationary position through 20 meters, and they had to perform those uh, three, three times, and the average. Uh, or was the final score. We also performed a long sprint. So it's a sprint from stationary position, starting at half court. They have to go around cones at baseline, down to the other end of the court, and we had to finish at half court. We had to perform three trials clockwise and also three trials counterclockwise. And the average score was calculated for each direction, so clockwise and counterclockwise. Then the third test was the up and back test. That was, uh, you can see that here in this uh, figure. It, they had to start from, again, a stationary position at baseline and then sprint to each of those seven lines. And they had to pass two wheels over each line, then reverse direction back to the baseline. And the time stops after the final baseline crossing because it is quite a, a tough test to do. They only had to perform this once. Fourth test was the passing test. They uh, had to throw the ball at the target from three positions. You can see that here in this uh, picture. 
um, from left uh, straight and uh, right position, and at two distances, so the long distance and the shorter distance. So the right and left passes were from uh, 1.83 uh, meters from the center and using the hand on the respective sides. And the distance, so the long and short distance, were not completely the same for the low class and the high class. The low class had to throw or bump the ball from around three meters and four and a half meters, and the high class from four and a half meters and from around six meters. We had to throw the ball five times from each location, and the score was according to the location on the target hit. So you can see here the target, and if you hit the center, then you get three points, around the center, two points, and a further away, uh, one point. So the total possible score from all those positions and the two distances was uh, 90 points maximum. Um, and the last test, the fifth test, was a slalom test. So again, they had to start from a stationary position at baseline uh, on the left side of the cones, and then they weaved through these seven cones measured 1.22 meters apart. And there were trials with the ball and also trials without the ball, and also starting from both sides, so the right and the left sides of these cones. And for each cone hit, one second was added to the time, and when they had to perform with the ball, the ball must be dribbled every 10 seconds, and if a violation occurs, then five seconds was added to their final time. So let's have a look at the results for first the uh, correlation. So what's the relationship among those components of a wheelchair rugby skill test? And you can see here the ball passing, and these are the, this is the relationship of ball passing with these other tests, so the sprint, long sprint, and slalom. And what you can see here is a, a moderate correlation. I mean, if you have a, a correlation of one, then that means that there is a perfect fit. So there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship with these two tests. So this is a, a moderate correlation with the ball passing and these more speed-based tests. However, if you look at the speed-based tests, so sprint, long sprint, uh, clockwise, counterclockwise, and slalom, you can see that there are high correlations uh, among these tests. For example, long sprint clockwise and counterclockwise is a uh, almost a perfect correlation. So if people score high on one test, they score high on the other test as well, which is visible in this um, graph. You can see here on the x-axis, the average time of the sprint test, the uh, first test location, and the average time of the slalom with ball. And the first test location, and all the dots are the participants. And you can see those who are slow on the sprint test are also slow on the slalom test, and and the other way around, if you're fast on one test, then you're also fast on the other test. If you look at the reliability of these wheelchair rugby skill tests in these 12 athletes, then you can see on average, the uh, scores are quite similar between the first test location and the second test location, and also the intra-class correlation. That says something about reliability. And again, that if it's a one, then it's a perfect reliability. These scores are also very high for all these tests. And if you have an example of the sprint test, so on the x-axis, you see now the sprint test at the first test location, and on the y-axis, the sprint test outcome on the second test location. And here are all the participants again, and you can see that the, if the dot is on that line, then they have exactly the same uh, time for the sprint test on the first and the second test location. You can see almost all those participants are on that line, or almost on that line, except for these three that are uh, who are a bit faster on the second test, but still uh, quite the same. We go to the second study, then we included also more about the uh, aerobic capacity. We included 60 national level wheelchair rugby players, both in the UK and in the Netherlands, and they had to perform two tests. One was the laboratory speed-based treadmill exercise test, which you can see here in the left picture. And they um, had a starting speed of 1.4 to 2.9 meters per second, was based on their classification, and also the increments uh, differed between classifications, um, could be between 0.2 and 0.4 meters per second every minute. And you can see here the modified multi stage field test uh, that was performed on the wooden sprung floor, which you can see on the picture uh, in the middle. And here on the right, you see the, uh, the, the, state, the multi stage field test. They had to push over 80 meters in a figure of eight, as you can see. Start speed was 1.8 meters per second, and every minute it was uh, increased by 0.1 meters per second, and it was prompted by an audio boom. So like a shuttle run test, they had to go faster and faster every minute. And this test was also terminated if the participant could not reach the target line, 
in two consecutive occasions, so despite strong verbal encouragement. And during both tests, we measured the oxygen uptake with the gas analysis system. And after the test, we uh, analyzed the peak oxygen uptake. So this is a, a very large uh, table with a lot of uh, uh, values, but I'll guide you through this table. This are, these are the 16 participants. They have a different classification, as you can see, different age and body mass. But these two columns are most interesting. It's the peak oxygen uptake measured in the lab and the peak oxygen uptake during the field test. And you can see on average, it's a similar value for the peak oxygen uptake, 1.84 versus 1.81. And the, our conclusion was also that the group average values are interchangeable. So that's a good uh, outcome. However, if we looked at the data at the level of the individual athlete, then it suggests that the individual results are not interchangeable. So for some uh, uh, individuals, that was the same, almost the same, or completely the same in these two. But there were also um, individuals that had quite a different uh, peak oxygen take during the lab and the field test. So the practical implications of study one is that all tests, except the passing, were highly correlated with each other, and that indicates that fewer tests could be included in the battery. So you don't have to perform all the tests if you're fast on one of the speed-based tests, then you're probably also very fast on the other speed-based test. And furthermore, we found that the wheelchair rugby skill tests were found to be reliable, so you can use them to monitor the skills over time. And for the uh, practical implication of study two, it's uh, that although the multi-stage field test may not consistently provide the same results for an individual as the treadmill test, it does provide a good indication of aerobic capacity. It can be used for monitoring wheelchair rugby performance over time. So but you have to stick at a certain test if you choose the treadmill test or the field test, you have to stick with that test over time to monitor uh, your athletes. Okay, thank you for your attention. That's uh, what I would like to present. Thank you, Sonia, that, uh, that was great. Um, I'll just wait for some questions to come in in the chat. Uh, maybe I can start with a short one. So you said study one, uh, you said it needs, there were quite some high correlations between some of the tests. Um, when you would be a practitioner and you had indeed limited time to test your, uh, your athletes, based on your experience in the testing process, could you like recommend a set of tests or, or um, could you say anything about that, how you could truncate the test battery? Yeah, that's of course also dependent on what you as a practitioner would like to know because the, the test, the sprint and also the long sprint and the slalom were really highly correlated. So you can imagine that uh, the sprint, I mean, it's uh, less time consuming than uh, for example, the long sprint. And then you choose that one. And I can also imagine that you would like to see what they can do with the ball. So like the slalom with ball would be interesting as well, of course, as well as the passing, because that was not really related to the to the speed-based test. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, I would pick that one, those ones. Yeah, great. Um, I'll just start then with um, a question from Claudio Pred. He asked, what is the ICC for the stage test? Uh, is there any information on that? Um, the ICC of this, uh, the, the, the field test, the multi-stage field test to, um, for the aerobic capacity, that was high as well. So, but on a group level, the, the outcome was uh, very reliable between the field test and the, and the um, lab test. However, if we looked at an individual level, that was, yeah, we, we can show the, the results also from the paper because that was a quite sophisticated uh, statistics, which I mm. didn't want to present here. Yeah. But then uh, the day-to-day -day variability between, uh, in, of an individual that is uh, uh, lower than the uh, variability between those two tests. So for an individual, at an individual level, we would pick one of the two and not uh, yeah, both. But yeah. it's still quite good, the reliability at a group level. Yeah, okay, that's right. Um, and then a question from Jens uh, Salvi. Um, do you believe that ball activities and chair activities are able to correlate with each other? Um, if it's ball activities like like the really the passing, so without um, moving the chair, I think that that's a different uh, component of wheelchair rugby skill than than also uh, involving uh, just uh, maneuvering and sprinting, etc. 
So, but for example, if you look at the slalom, then you also need, if, if it's with the ball, you also have to dribble. Then it seems to be well correlated to only slalom with it, without the ball. So that's, if it's combined, then it's, then it's still mostly the speed based that's uh, the most uh, important component. But if you're just looking at the passing, then it's a different test. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be really correlated to the speed based test. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thanks. I see there's one question left from Anna Hart or Anne Hart. Uh, but if you could answer that in the chat, then we can uh, move on yeah. with, uh, with the next speaker. Okay. Um, and the next speaker is uh, Rima Sechter. So he is an um, associate professor at the uh, UMCG in Groningen and is also a visiting fellow at uh, Lapa University. Um, and he will uh, present on sprint performance and asymmetries in wheelchair rugby. So over to you, uh, Rima. Uh, thanks, Fen, and thanks, uh, Vicky, for inviting me to this uh, symposium. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, today I will tell you about a specific example of uh, lab-based tests that I think are relevant for wheelchair rugby. But before I do that, please uh, let me say greetings from Groningen. Uh, that's where uh, I work. Uh, I lead a uh, wheelchair propulsion uh, lab as a human movement scientist in the University Medical Center uh, of Groningen. And we do a lot with uh, the rehabilitation of wheelchair users, but also uh, nowadays much with Paralympic sports. And um, uh, starting with this presentation, I, I look back a little to see when we actually started collaborating with the Peter Harrison Center. And I think it was back in 2013 that I first visited uh, the old lab. And we started using the ergometer and the measurement wheels to see if uh, biomechanical analyses for wheelchair rugby players uh, are useful. And uh, since then, uh, we have done multiple uh, experiments uh, where we uh, measured athletes uh, on these uh, strange kind of uh, equipment uh, far from the field in a lab. Uh, and I hope to convince you that doing these things actually can be very useful, not only for science, but also for wheelchair rugby performance. So uh, let me first try to do a very brief uh, explanation of an ergometer and measures of power output. So if you uh, place a person in a wheelchair on such a device, the rollers are capable of not only measuring your velocity, so how fast you go or how fast you accelerate, but are also able to measure something about your force production, which comes uh, in a measure uh, named power output. And that power output, I think, is very uh, important in addition to those uh, uh, descriptions of uh, speed or acceleration. And uh, the one thing that I'll uh, explain today is the usefulness of looking at uh, both limbs at the same time. So if you look at the left side and the right side at the same time on an ergometer, you will see how a person uh, is uh, symmetrical or asymmetrical. And in actuality, uh, from all our measurements, a person never does the same thing at both sides uh, at the same time. You always do a little bit more on the left or a little bit more on the right. But on average, that uh, usually... Uh, averages out and you go in a straight line if you want. The ergometer is a, a very special in that it can do something different because if we ask you to do a full out sprint, you won't uh, uh, think about the differences you have, to have in your left and in your right hand. You'll just go all out and you'll find out the differences afterwards. And in these two pictures, you can see two examples. And in the above, you see a person that is a relatively quick uh, high point player that finishes a court distance sprint in about 7.6 seconds with his fastest hand being the purple, the upper one. But you can also see that his other hand uh, is trailing behind and doesn't have the same capabilities as his fastest hand. And you might appreciate perhaps that in the field you'll be as fast as your slowest hand, 
Uh, so uh, it's quite important to see uh, how these differences are there. On the other hand, uh, in, the low, uh, in the lower graph, you can see a low point player with relatively uh, no asymmetries. So the lines are almost fully overlapping. And uh, this person, uh, although uh, doesn't perform as fast, seems to be fairly uh, symmetric. So uh, what you see here is basically uh, the competition we made out of it. So uh, we measured everybody on the ergometer and we have them all uh, uh, do a sprint. And we took the distance as the outcome and made a full sprint. So that's the 28 meter of court distance you have. And you will see the photo finished of the uh, fastest player when he arrives. So in the upper uh, red ball here is the fastest. And he finishes first. And here you can see uh, where the rest of the uh, players are at that point. And you can appreciate that uh, the, uh, the red balls, so the high point classified players, on average indeed are faster than uh, the low point players. But indeed that there are some low point players like the, the fastest uh, blue square, uh, which is about the mean of the uh, high point players. And I think this uh, also comes back a little to what uh, Viola said before, and that is you can't classify on the outcome measure. Uh, so it's not that based on these kind of uh, results, you would say your classification should be different, but it does help you to think about how come this low point player is as fast as he or she is. And uh, is that uh, training? Is that skill? Is there uh, something else going on? And I think this already gives some very interesting data. In addition, we did something else. And that is, uh, this graph shows the fastest hand. So uh, when the fastest hand of the upper person was at the finish, uh, then we stopped this whole picture but we can then measure the differences in how uh, much your slowest hand has trailed behind. So uh, uh, how many meters are you slower with your slowest hand? We can put that also in a graph. And there, I think we were most surprised in the amount uh, of asymmetry some of the players had. So um, it's a bit perhaps of a strange way to uh, uh, say how you uh, measure asymmetry. But here, if you can remember, on a 28 meter court, there is a person that has a six meters difference between both limbs. So I think that very much shows the effect, the functional effect of that asymmetry. It means that you're uh, almost 25% uh, slower with your slowest hand. And what you also can see is that those asymmetries are much more profound with the high point players. And I think uh, that is probably also because that was reason for their classification as it is, or for their, uh, but uh, if you see it like this, it suddenly becomes much more interesting to see how you can address that. And that of course is a difficult question. It might be addressed to, to training or positioning in a chair, uh, perhaps some of the, the physiotherapists can work with this, but knowing these kind of measures, I think, are very relevant to uh, see if you can improve uh, that on-court performance. Um, just to reiterate, if you have a bimanual task like wheelchair propulsion, you'll never do the same left and right, but it will average out. Uh, what we also did was have some of the uh, 3D kinematic analyses of a positioning in the chair. And what you could see for some of these is that also the positioning uh, was kind of uh, asymmet asymmetric uh, from the start. So um, just to explain what you see is from the front, a person's thorax, it's uh, scapulas, it's shoulder blades, 
the arms and the wheels. And you can see that uh, the trunk is nice in the middle for this symmetrical athlete. But this asymmetrical athlete here is already positioned to the side and under an angle. And expecting asymmetry from this position might already uh, not be, uh, well, what you actually expect. And I'm always thinking this person, probably some you can't change, but uh, might, not, uh, might not have been able to get him a little bit more to the left and would not already uh, be useful, for instance. So this is a very uh, short, explicit example of doing lab work and seeing how that is uh, useful uh, for thinking about the performance of athletes. Uh, actually, we've made these lab tests even more intricate. And uh, well, Simon Briley uh, is not presenting here today, but he's one of the PhDs at the Peter Harrison Center that has continued a lot of uh, this work and has uh, done a lot of the biomechanics uh, of these performances. And he's actually written some very nice papers uh, already, and he's almost finished. So I think that already came out of this kind of work and it's very, uh, shows the potential. And actually, uh, currently in the Netherlands, we are also kind of copying the approach from the Peter Harrison Center. And we currently try to do the same in our Dutch wheel power project. And there we have developed uh, a new kind of a type of ergometer, currently also uh, in Vicky's lab. And we hope to do these kind of tests in a much more uh, systematic way over the season uh, and see how we can uh, support the athletes this way in improving uh, their power on the field. So that was, uh, I think... Uh, what I wanted to tell you, I hope you uh, found this a, a nice example of uh, a biomechanical approach to uh, in, uh, improving performance. And if there's any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Again, I just wait for some questions to come in uh, through the chat. I'm sure they will come. Um, I just got a question from Peter van Leeuwen. Um, is it also possible that fitting asymmetric already is an adaptation of the asymmetry present in the arms or the arm movement? Yes, I think that could very much be the case. Uh, so indeed, uh, yes, I, I, thanks for that comment. Uh, yes, you'll, you'll have asymmetries. Most of us will have them anyway to a certain extent, and you'll probably find a way to uh, address them as good as possible and it, indeed it might that that positioning that i told you about was a functional adaptation uh, so uh, yeah that might be worthwhile to uh, uh, to investigate actually yeah yeah nice. and then the next question is from lukas jankowski um, have you done research uh, into people with symmetric limb deficiencies um, have to think a bit about what, he, what is yeah. actually meant by a symmetric limb deficiency. So Perhaps, Lucas, if you if you are willing to, you can put your uh, your speaker on and, and maybe uh, explain yourself further. Uh, my question, hello. Uh, my question was about uh, er uh, research using uh, using an ergometer, but with. Uh, people having asymmetric limb deficiencies, for example, different uh, amputation in the, uh, for example, right hand and the left mm -hmm. hand. For, for example, if the right hand has uh, no deficiencies, but the left arm is uh, above yes. elbow uh, amputation, have you done research on such athletes, uh, for example? No, actually I have not uh, done much research on those very explicit uh, asymmetries, uh, but I think uh, our, our uh, approach would very well fit to, to measure those. And um, that would be very interesting, actually. Yes. Thank you for your answer. That's great. I'm just, uh, I see that there are many questions coming in uh, for you, Rima. I'm just conscious of time. So if you are okay to answer those in the chat, um, 
then we can move on uh, with the next uh, speaker. If For it's sure. okay to, to unshare your screen. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, Okay, so the next speaker is Rink van der Slikke. Uh, he is a, a researcher at The Hague University uh, in The Hague, uh, and he's also a visiting fellow at Loughborough University. Um, and he will talk about individualized support or sport performance support for wheelchair rugby athletes. Uh, over to you, Rink. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, indeed, my presentation will be about uh, the application of um, science in uh, in wheelchair sports, so bringing it to sports um, uh, practice um, and hopefully empower athletes and uh, uh, coaches as well to uh, uh, apply the scientific knowledge in their daily uh, routine. Yeah, um, I started working in uh, wheelchair sports about eight years ago um, with a PhD in um, uh, about uh, developing a method using inertial sensors to measure a wheelchair uh, mobility performance, so uh, the, the speed, the travel distance, the number of pushes, uh, turns left and right, all kinds of stuff like that, um, and actually to measure it on the field, so not uh, compared to what Reamer described before, uh, not in the lab, but to see what they are doing in training and match uh, situations, um, and that ended up in this uh, thesis, and of course I was very uh, pleased with it, but um, still, if you want to continue to use it in that way, uh, then still it was me going to all kinds of venues, matches, uh, to measure all the athletes uh, for their performance. So I, I had to go there uh, with all my sensors and with all my kit and the Wi-Fi routers and everything that was uh, needed. Um, so to make it more uh, closer to the actual sport practice, um, I... Well, intended to make it uh, more accessible to uh, coaches and, uh, and athletes. And the first step uh, in that direction was to uh, get rid of me, which was uh, um, received with uh, great uh, enthusiasm, of course. So we, in, instead of uh, using all this uh, high-end uh, technology, we tried to um, reduce the method to uh, where it was uh, possible to put it in an uh, app. So we had an uh, iOS app developed that could um, calculate basic outcomes of uh, performance. Um, and the second step was to make use of uh, more accessible uh, sensors. So the, the ones I use are very expensive. Um, so we uh, switched to sensors that were cheaper at a much a longer uh, battery life and were uh, also a bit more uh, uh, stable. So at the moment we can measure a wheelchair mobility performance based on two sensors on the on the wheelchair, one on the frame and one on the uh, right wheel. And with that, you can calculate all kinds of outcomes, uh, like I mentioned, regarding speed and uh, uh, travel distance, rotations, uh, yeah, all those uh, performance uh, outcomes. Um, and once we had that app developed, uh, I started using it with the Dutch national athletes uh, in all sports, so in wheelchair racing, in wheelchair basketball, wheelchair rugby, uh, wheelchair tennis. Uh, para triathlon, um, and uh, for, I have some examples about how I use them. Um, the best uh, implicate uh, the, the best use case was with the, the a Dutch female uh, wheelchair basketball team, uh, but of course the the way we use it is similar to uh, wheelchair uh, rugby. So we used it for all athletes, and we uh, started with the. the let's say the early adapt, uh, adapters, so the athletes that were keen on having their performance measured. And once they started using it, we tried to uh, get uh, each time each more players uh, engaged. Um, finally, up to all players were using their own uh, performance. Uh, and during the last, um, say, eight months, we have about uh, a thousand measurements of uh, wheelchair uh, training sessions or wheelchair uh, practice matches. We haven't measured during a tournament uh, yet in this configuration, uh, but we hope to do that in uh, in near future. But of course, there weren't a lot of uh, matches played uh, during the last uh, last year, except for the Paralympics itself. So we have a lot of data, uh, a lot of uh, uh, data from all the uh, players, and they were able to me measure their own, their own performance as well of, as providing me the overall data of their uh, uh, measurements. 
Uh, and well, we, we can say it, uh, it leads to success because the female uh, Dutch uh, team uh, won the gold medal. Apparently, it's not the only way to success, I discovered, because uh, in wheelchair rugby, it were the, the English that uh, um, won the gold medal. Uh, but uh, hopefully, supporting the athletes in this way can uh, at least add to success or um, add to uh, keeping that uh, success. If we have a look at um, uh, team data, um, so if I measure in, in a more scientific way, I can have a look at the different uh, uh, outcomes. For example, the intensity, which is a rough estimate of how intense uh, of the power of the, of the player. And you can see that during the, the training sessions, which are on top each time, and then uh, below that is the, is the match, uh, the average of the match situations. If we look at 600 uh, training sessions, or 600 uh, measurements, uh, about 530 training sessions and about uh, 65 uh, measurements of uh, match situations, then you see that overall a training session is quite similar to uh, the average match uh, performance. If we look at intensity, if we look at the time they spent in certain speed zones, uh, you can see, for example, that during a match there, there's a bit more uh, time in uh, um, uh, driving backwards more than there is in, uh, uh, in the training session. And also for a rotational speed, you can see it's quite similar for overall, uh, if we have a look at all the players. But of course, sport isn't based on uh, the average. If you want to train the, each individual athlete optimally, you need to know how they uh, perform on an indiv individual uh, level. So if we have a look at uh, the same graphs, but for an individual player, then you can see that, for example, if we look at the upper two bars, then intensity and the time spent in certain speed zones indeed is, is similar for the, the five match, matches that were measured compared to the 50 training sessions. But if you have a look at rotational speed, there is quite some difference for this uh, specific player. There's much more, informa uh, much more time in high rotational uh, speed zones um, for this uh, player, both to the left and to the right. So if you want to pre pre prepare this um, athlete well for a match situation, it's probably best also to incorporate uh, certain aspects of a training that require more rotational uh, movement. So that's what we uh, concluded. And of course, this is just an example. I can't show you all the data because uh, the, the, the coach of the D Dutch um, wheelchair basketball athlete uh, team will not be happy if I show you all the specific data, but just to give you an example, if you have a look at individual uh, player data, then you can uh, see that the patterns might differ, whereas on group level, you might conclude that uh, it's all more or less alike, whether or not you a training or a match, uh, have a, a match measurement. Another way of showing it, if for example, I have a look at the high acceleration, so how often, um, does a player acquire more than five meters per uh, second uh, acceleration? Uh, and we have here on the y-axis the match situation and uh, on the x-axis the, the training sessions. And then you see that overall there's quite a nice relationship between the bonds that are have more higher intensity uh, occasions, both in training and in, in match uh, sessions. Um, but if we split them by, by athletes, you see that, well, there are quite a lot of athletes that have way higher a number of uh, high intensity uh, movements during a match, during match play than they have during a training session. So again, uh, on group level, it might be more or less the same. <clears throat> but um, if you have a look at individual athletes, there are quite some differences. And that is, of course, a relevant information if you want to uh, optimize uh, the training uh, situation. If we have a look at this, ath this uh, athlete with the dashed line, not the dotted, but the dashed, then you can see, well, I have the 55 training sessions with an average of uh, uh, 42 um, high acceleration um, occasions. And during a match, it is um, about uh, nearly 80 uh, times. And you can also have a look at, well, which training sessions were similar to the, to the match. So you can also have a look at, because you have all the measurements, you can 
kind of look at where the uh, specific training situations occurred that were more match-like than uh, all the, uh, the training sessions, uh, sessions uh, together. One other brief example. Um, so this, what I uh, um, described before was uh, if you follow each athlete during training and match sessions, but you can also use the same type of methods um, for individual um, uh, occasional measurements. So for the, this example, uh, we had one future rugby player and uh, the technician was trying to find out what was the best um, uh, seat height for this uh, particular player. So this here he did a sprint test, a 20 meter sprint test <coughs> in his uh, wheelchair like it was. And then he adjusted uh, the seat height. And if you do that, uh, for this player, you can see that well, the first two free pushes are quite similar, but then you see that due to the increased seat height, um, he uses more trunk flexion. Apparently, this athlete was able to do that, given his classification. And you see that there is a bit more acceleration in, in each push than uh, with the lower seat height. So that's, that's good. But on the other hand, because the trunk was more involved, it also uh, reduced um, its uh, push frequency. So you see that the, the number of pushes with the uh, orange line is less than the, the uh, standard line he, uh, he showed before. <coughs> so in this way, you can actually change the wheelchair setting and evaluate how the uh, uh, athlete is performing for each different um, uh, setting. And this, the third was quite similar, but there, he used a different um, a trunk strapping um, a bit higher. And then you can see again that that affects each, uh, the way he pushes and how you can, uh, uh, how the performance was. And maybe you can use that again to optimize his setting. And of course, if you keep uh, measuring them during the training sessions and the match as matches as well, you can find uh, occasions where he sprinted to see whether or not uh, what we measure here uh, will stay also uh, during a longer, uh, longer time. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so to conclude, um, using the inertial sensors and app was uh, feasible, which was a good uh, outcome of the, this, uh, this test. Um, and uh, it, it could be used for individual uh, optimizations, uh, both from a training uh, perspective, but also for um, optimizing wheelchair uh, settings. And of course, since I only have data of, of one uh, team, or um, it's hard to show you all the details because that uh, uh, wouldn't be right to the coach and athlete. But hopefully in the future, we will have um, uh, measurements of uh, multiple teams and then it's, we can kind of show more uh, detailed uh, data about uh, the performances. Okay, that was my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you, Rink. Really nice of you. Uh your measurement device and there are already a few questions in the chat um, so first fabian uh, amon he um, asked a question about the drift in the accelerometer um, so how did you correct uh, the data in your measurements um, as the training sessions can be quite long and he expected there might be some drift in the data no i you have hardly drift in acceleration sensors um, and to be honest um, the key uh, sensor for my analysis is the gyroscope. <coughs> Sorry. Um, th they tend to drift a little bit more, but um, uh, you can easily correct for it. Uh, to, and when you detect moments of standstill, then you can kind of uh, um, de uh, detect uh, the offset and then correct for it. So if they drift, you can easily correct for it. And, and it's hardly an issue during the measurements I, uh, I've done so far. Um, and Jens Saubier asks whether the performance measurement system is publicly available. Um, well, the, the method as uh, described, so using the inertial sensors that is uh, published, so that's publicly available. Um, the app, li uh, like we use it at the moment, uh, isn't, and, and uh, that's a bit um, uh, that's a bit of pity. <laughs> I would really like to have it a version that is publicly available. Uh, but app like it is developed now, it is um, connected to a, a OneDrive, 
where all the raw data are sent to and that's just a single one drive so if i share it with other people then all those other people are also able to see the the results of the different teams so that's not very um, convenient um but we are working on a version where we can um, make it more uh, accessible to other people as well um i'll just because there's a break after this so let's do the uh, last question as well from um, from thomas's iphone um what is the rationale for high speed activities to be over five meters per second um and would this be relative to physical capacity or classification um no the, uh, um, well the rationale at the moment is it's just um um <laughs> i just chose those thresholds so there's no um very uh, good foundation for that at, uh, at the moment um, but that was chosen just to um, give easy uh, accessible feedback to athletes and coaches so they, they really loved having it in a kind of traffic light model with uh, green uh, red and orange um, and now since I have uh, those thousand measurements I can maybe have a more educated um, uh, choice about uh, the, the boundaries Albeit that, of course, it's, this is only for a female wheelchair basketball team. So uh, maybe we need more measurements to get um, a hard, um, uh, uh, to get more uh, uh, better defined uh, thresholds for those uh, differences. Yeah. 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 No, that makes sense. Okay. Then we come to the end of this session. Um, and we have a break, unless Vicky wants to wrap this session up uh, before the break. If not, then. Uh, um, I suggest uh, stand up, walk a bit, or, or do some movement, and uh, then we come back uh, in 45 minutes from uh, from now. Just a, a quick message, I guess, housekeeping for everybody who is still on the call but maybe dashing off. Just to let you know, I can't remember if I mentioned it at the start, but if people need any certification for attending this uh, educational event, then please contact um Sven um what we will be doing is obviously sending out a link where people can obtain the video and circulate it to friends and colleagues who perhaps haven't been able to uh, log on today so um yeah we'll be sending out some further information just at, at the end via um your login details but uh, enjoy the the break have a stretch and hopefully see some of you again um starting at uh I'm, not, I'm on british time but uh 3 30 in the afternoon so it's a 45 minute break now <laughs>